Good morning, everyone. This is December 5th, 2018. Um, we are on the teaching and learning call uh, for Aperio, and um, my name is Tricia Gordon. I'm at the University of Virginia, and I'm facilitating today's call. Welcome. Um, so before we get started with our main um, presentation and discussion, I wonder if anyone has any announcements to share. Um, hi, this is Wilma. I just have a quick announcement about Sakai Camp. Um, Sakai Camp is going to be in January, the 27th through the 30th, um, January 2019 in Orlando, Florida. And it's always a really great um, meeting for planning and um, talking about the roadmap of Sakai, future Sakai, kind of diving into some in-depth discussions because it's a two and a half day um, in-person event. Um, and I encourage anybody who's thinking about attending to go ahead and register. Um, there is no registration fee. Um, you just have to pay for your hotel when you get here. And, um, and we are providing lunch and everything this year. So um, it's, it's always a very, very productive event. So I encourage folks to um, think about joining us in Orlando. Wonderful. Yes, I can attest to it's a very productive meeting and it is also a lot of fun and it's great to actually get to spend time with each other in person. So hope you guys can make it. All right. Any other announcements? And I am going to turn it over to Trish, Wilma, are you, sorry, yes? This is Laura Geckler. I think you have an announcement. Oh, <laughs> I think you're right. Um, my dear colleague, Matt Burgess, who's also a facilitator regularly on the teaching and learning calls, he and his wife recently had their first baby, baby girl. Her name is Harper. And Woot! Yeah, we are very excited for them, and uh, right now they're both on paternity slash maternity leave, but um, looking forward to meeting them, meeting the new baby. Yeah, yeah, it's a good name. Thanks for that reminder, Laura. You're welcome. 2.0, absolutely. Awesome. So, Wilma, it looks like you may have presenter privileges already, yes? Hang on, let me see here. Yeah, oh, I'm able to. Okay. All the right. screen. So, let me get the screen share going. It'll take a, just okay. a minute. We're going to dive into um, a review of Lessons 2.0 and the Sakai Roadmap um, with Wilma, Josh, and Derek Ramsey when he joins. Thank you, guys. As soon as Wilma gets presentation up, we'll get started with that. Okay, you guys see my screen yet? Not yet. Oh, here it comes. Now, yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I apologize in advance for those of you who have already seen this um, maybe a couple times. <laughs> We've been doing the grand tour, uh, visiting all the different groups, and this is actually um, taken from the slides that we did at the virtual conference. So I'm going to try to move pretty quickly through this, but just for um, anyone who maybe um, didn't see, catch one of those um, appearances <laughs> or if... Um, you know, because I know this is being recorded also for the YouTube channel. So I'm going to do just a real whirlwind um, uh, trip through the slides here about the Lessons 2.0 project. So basically, um, we're proposing, Longside is proposing some significant improvements to the Lessons tool. And it's sort of a three-pronged approach. Um, we want to really expand the capabilities of Lessons. It tends to be one of the more heavily used 
tools to address a lot of those pedagogical questions that people ask or things that they want to do, goals they want to accomplish in their courses. Um, and we'd really like to improve the overall UI, both to make it harmonious with the rest of Sakai, but also to make it more intuitive and modern. Um, for, for end users. And then um, reducing the technical debt is also a big concern. That is actually one of the motivating factors because um, it's built on some aging architecture. So we need to kind of get that up just enough. And just a very rough estimate, um, when we got together at our um, staff retreat, we sort of mapped out um, what this proposal would cover. And this is our estimate for the amount of hours that that might take. Um, so I know it's a, it looks like a big number, but if you kind of break it up, you know, hopefully you guys won't get sick or shock or anything. Um, this isn't meant to be um, shouldered by any one institution. This is something that we're hoping we can kind of spread the load a little bit. Um, but the idea in a, in a nutshell is to make lessons more of a lightweight site builder as opposed to just a page creation tool. Um, so we looked at things like Google and Wix and other website builders as inspiration for ways that we might um, improve the lesson building process to make it more in line with what people are used to in other types of, of website applications. And, um, and we did do a little bit of competitive analysis too to look at other LMSs and what they're doing in this space. And there wasn't anything terribly wonderful out there. And so I really think this is an opportunity that Sakai can become a leader in this space and, and do something that's better than the competition. So some different areas, and again, I'm going to breeze through these. Don't put too much stock in these images. These are just visualizations that we came up with just as sort of, you know, throwing a dart on the wall to, you know, see where it lands. Um, this may not look anything like what the final version looks like. Again, they're just very, very um, rough mock-ups. Um, but some of the different areas that we heard from users because we did a number of focus groups and presentations and birds of a feathers and such. Um, page layout is something that people really wanted more control over. They wanted to more easily um, manipulate the design of the page and organize the content a little more intuitively. Um, Another thing that we wanted to be able to take full advantage of is inline editing and CK editor improvements. The CK editor has a lot of um, bells and whistles that we're not really taking advantage of right now. So things like editing items in place, um, using drag and drop, um, being able to uh, more, more quickly change the layout, um, those kinds of things can be done in CK Editor if we um, look at, at bringing in some of those enhancements. Um, another thing that is kind of painful right now um, when you're trying to rearrange or move content in a lesson, copying pages or copying items on a page can sometimes be very um, laborious for users. So we wanted to simplify that process and maybe make drag and drop and reordering um, a more clean and, um, and simple task. And then we also heard from a lot of folks that having some sort of an undo is a real um, sticking point because right now you can um, delete a page and it doesn't go away. It just goes to the index. But if you delete content on a page, it's gone. And there's sort of no trash bin. There's no undelete. So we wanted to have some sort of a versioning or soft delete or history possibly um, so that we can prevent that type of data loss. And then another big idea is um, templating. So the, the idea that you can create these templates and maybe share them out at the institution level or even at the individual level if they have a certain layout, but give users a, a better starting point for um, building a lesson because a lot of times that, that empty page can be a little intimidating. People don't know what to put on there, where it should go. And if you can give folks a little bit of structure that they can then work from and manipulate and modify if they need to, but it gives a, an easier um, on-ramp to using lessons. So, um, and theoretically you could develop templates for different types of pages um, that people would, would usually have in a course. So um, it, it makes it easier to um, 
to get going quickly with um, building a, a course. And then also um, some of these templates could potentially replace tools that are not uh, updated terribly often um, that need a little bit of, of reworking in any case. So things like syllabus and wiki uh, are both getting really long in the tooth and there's been talk of possibly removing them from the code base, but they do serve a purpose. Um, however, the, the things that they do, the, the types of actions that you do in those tools could easily be replicated in something like lessons. Um, so, uh, you know, it could theoretically replace tools that are um, not really uh, updated well or used very well. And then obviously we want to maintain the existing functionality as much as possible. We know people have a lot of stuff in lessons right now. And so we want to preserve all of that as much as possible. Um, now there may be some things that don't carry over simply because there's a better way of doing it um, or it just doesn't make sense in the new um, workflow. So it might not be an exact one-to-one -one correlation, but we do want to make sure that there's a clean and easy path to move content from one version to the next and that um, all the existing content is something that people can continue to leverage. And then finally, um, the, the technical debt is, is underpinning the whole thing. Um, we do need to update RSF. We need to improve security. We need to modernize um, the code base so that future development is um, in line with, with more modern technologies. So this is our overall timeline and um, we're about halfway through this right now. We did some focus groups back earlier in the fall. Some of you on this call probably participated in those. Um, we had a staff retreat in October where we kind of kicked around some ideas and did some, um, you know, investigation of other platforms. Uh, we put together a concept document with a plan, you know, an outline. And right now we're in the seeking input phase. Um, we uh, sort of started off with the SVC presentation and then we've been going around to various groups and um, giving people an opportunity to provide feedback because that's really important that we want to include as much of the community feedback as possible so that everyone is happy with this plan before we really dive into it. Um, we were hoping that backend development might begin by the end of the year, although that could be a little iffy just depending on the, um, you know, the release plans for 19, um, which got pushed back a little bit. Um, but uh, we do uh, intend to take all of the feedback that we've been gathering over the last couple months and do a revised concept plan. There's a, a version one of the concept plan out there right now, which I can give you a link to if, if Josh hasn't already. Um, but we're gonna revise that based on the feedback that we receive and, and present the second draft at Sakai Camp, although we'll also make it available for other folks in the community who, who aren't able to join us in Orlando. Um, and then based on um, that discussion there, needs any final tweaking, we'll finalize the, um, the overall design early in the year, begin development, and the, the goal is to get these changes into Sakai 20. So we want to have the work done by you know September-ish when we anticipate that this uh, code freeze for Sakai 20 would happen um, so that it can roll out with the next major version of Sakai. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the overview. Um, and now I will um, actually, let me exit out of here. And let me, I'll, I'll share this link with you. This is a link to the concept doc. Actually, let me get a shareable Josh link here. Josh it in the chat for us. Oh, he did already? Okay, yeah. great. So Thank this you. is the concept, but it basically goes through the same kind of, of information that I just did in the in the presentation. So um, feel free to comment on this. I know Laura already has, <laughs> if you other folks mm -hmm. have. Feel free to comment. Um, we can collect your, your input there, and we can also collect it here on this feedback um, notes document that, that Josh has been keeping where we've been trying to collect, you know, as we've been visiting all the different groups, um, feedback from the, each group so that we can then sort of compile it all together and uh, revise that, that document. So, um, so at this point, um, Josh, do you want to kind of lead the, the feedback gathering portion? Sure, let's do that. So um, the, the question that uh, I want to ask you guys first is, 
what resonates most to you, what seems to work well about this concept. So we, we tend to ask three questions. What works well about this concept? What could be improved? And what's missing? Uh, a lot of times we tend to gravitate toward improvements, and those are really important. But I think hearing from you guys what works well is, is critical as well, because it, uh, it may be that the project needs to be scoped in phases so that some things get done first and some things later. So knowing what resonates most is going to be helpful in terms of setting those priorities. So what are, what are your thoughts? What works well and or resonates most about this, about this concept before we move to improvements? Feel free to come on the mic or chat, and we'll repeat what you chat for the recording. So nothing works well <laughs> currently. So you guys don't like anything about the plan, okay? <laughs> Right. Is it? Do you mean what works well with the plan? What works well with the project plan? Not okay. necessarily what works well with lessons right now. Uh, that's a different question. Um, okay. What we want feedback on is our project. I mean, do you, what do you think? You know, sounds like a good idea in this plan. Um, are we are we focusing on the right things? Are there any particular aspects? Um, that we mentioned that we want to improve that are high priority items for your users, that sort of thing. We, we've already heard from the chat from the folks at Durham Tech, uh, the idea that replacing the current syllabus tool is something that uh, that is an area, a thing that they would support. What else? I like that suggestion, but I think for me personally, um, it's more important to get the tool um, looking good, working well, having good functionality um, before we talk about replacing other tools. Personally, and and so I like the the um, the features that have been recommended. I love the idea of adding some templates to help instructors build their content more easily, you know, and have it looking nice. That's a really good thought. And I think one of the most important things, I think Charles mentioned it in the chat, is um, being able to um, port content from one site over to another site and have the links update and all of that. That's, that can be challenging, and but it's very important. I see um, Jennifer likes the idea of using more of the CK editor features. Absolutely. Take advantage of that. And folks are adding comments. So I don't know, Josh, if I am I don't have the feedback document open, but if you're looking at it and have anything to add for the recording. Yep, it's it's great for people to add there. I've been trying to capture stuff from the chat as well, so I think we can we can all just uh, muck around in here. It's perfectly fine. <clears throat> it'll be uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, so so we we've heard uh, keeping track of deleted pages is something that is important to people. Reducing technical debt, using more of the CK editor features that may be underused or are underutilized. Um, so yes, absolutely. One of the other things that uh, that Earl would say if he were here is that we'd want to focus on using, not necessarily always writing our own uh, tools and, and components. We want to reuse components from elsewhere, wherever we can, ones that are that, that look great, that work well, that are well supported, so that we're not reinventing the wheel over and over again. Absolutely. So the, the, the CK editor thoughts are in that vein, but it, they're not the only mm -hmm. thoughts in that vein. I don't think it was mentioned necessarily, but I think we all have this idea too that we need to be consistent in our labeling and naming of things from tool to tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we're actually we've been talking to Duke because they've been doing quite a lot with the um, the UX uh, style guide inventory, and we've been talking to their um, web development group um, to see if maybe we can partner with them on some of the design 
of the UI. So um, that's still very much up in the air um, based on their timeline and, and uh, availability to take on new projects. But we're hoping that we can partner with them for that to really kind of be able to get more bang for a buck as far as um, the style guide work that's already been done. And I think it's also worth noting that UI, UI UX design needs to happen regardless. So having the folks at Duke do it because they've already been involved in the Switch project uh, produces uh, a win-win from that perspective. And also because that's that's a way for uh, you know Duke to demonstrate their, their leadership of Sakai, which they, they do all the time anyway. But, you know, I, I think trying to, you know, trying to put our best foot forward as a community also in the in the UX design is a good thing. Um, yeah. and I, so Terry Golightly makes two points in the chat that I have put into the document. And we've, we've heard those from Terry before, and it's great to reiterate those now. But the idea is that uh, as much as we love drag and drop, there needs to be uh, an equally capable uh, way to do similar kinds of things for folks who use screen readers and for folks who have uh, you know, who use other kinds of assistive technologies for their documents. Keyboard well. only, yeah. Yep, absolutely. So tabbing, tabbing forever is, is not really what we want to do. We want something better than that. And the idea would be to, to build that in from the start. Yeah. Good points, Terry. I would say those of you who've made points in prior discussions that, that we've recorded, uh, feel free to make them again if you want. Uh, don't feel bound to make them again if you, if you feel like you've been you've been sufficiently heard. I mean, so make the points if you want to if you want to reiterate them or if you think they move the conversation forward. But we absolutely have captured the points that you've made in the past. Those of you who've seen this and commented on this a couple of times. I'm curious. Longsight, you there was a slide that mentioned the um, cost of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, about twenty five hundred hours to um, make at least the first phase of lessons two point available by next September. What are I'm just curious, what funding is already available for this, and um, are you do you need make a request to others in the community for funding? So that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, the approach that we're taking to this from a funding perspective is one in which we settle on the idea first. Let's, let's have an idea that people can really get behind. And then once we're behind it, let's all fan out and make the case for funding at, at our institutions. And Logsite is willing to commit to this as well, you know, to, to support this with, with developer hours. But it seems to me that un, until we know, until we're all on board with, with a plan, you know, yeah. it, to talk about funding is premature. Now, on the other hand, if there were an institution that were to step forward and say, um, we want to put 100K on, on this plan, we just want you to make it really good, uh, you know, that would be amazing. I would love that, you know, but I don't expect that either. I think that we'll, you know, those of us who feel strongly about this will need to, to beat the bushes on this. And I think that there are also two ways to approach the funding. So, uh, you know, that that number follows the, the long sites uh, model of, of uh, charging an hourly rate for development. I think there's, there's the time-honored Sakai model of, of supplying uh, development resources. You know, certainly, you know, Tricia, your, your folks are putting in a lot of effort on, on site builder right now. So um, a cheaper way to do this would be to uh, pull together funding to hire a person to do it, as opposed to running it through a, a, a per hourly funnel. So either way can work, it can work in combination. You know, it's we're most interested in, in getting this done. Yeah. Because yeah. these are important investments in Sakai and they're, they're gonna benefit all of us in the long run. Oh yeah, for sure. Very yeah. exciting. This is Laura. I, um, yeah, I wanted to chime in about uh, the funding and the. Um, so for some people, it because this has been previewed to us a number of times, uh, we may feel like the design of lessons is is really um, very far along when in fact, um, some of the major uh, considerations about what Lessons 2.0 is going to be uh, 
haven't been entirely uh, nailed down yet. One of them for me is whether or not Lessons is primarily, Lessons 2.0 is primarily a really cool layout and organization tool or whether, um, whether it is in fact um, or includes uh, is some kind of authoring content tool, uh, which I've got to tell you, if it includes authoring content, then um, some of the under the covers work that is often not thought about is how those, um, that content that's created then gets uh, copied um, from semester to semester or site to site. And, um, you know, whether it's copied in its original state or as a draft or published or that, that sort of thing. So, so it, it, and it could be phased, but um, my point is, is that the uh, design work is far from being done. And until we know what it is we're building, it's really hard to collect funding. That's just reiterating what, what Josh was pointing out. Um, another thing I've noticed as the community matures and um, the model of uh, getting work done changes from those of us who can contribute our own developer staff to those of us who contribute more monetarily or QA or testing um, is that uh, Longsight has taken the lead in a lot of this. Uh, their livelihood as a service provider and a hosting provider depends upon the longevity of Sakai. However, um, they, they really have a big voice in North America and the Sakai community is international. So some of these preview design kinds of things uh, will have to be done in places other than North America, places where um, maybe it's had less exposure. Uh, there's a good, a good apparel conference in Cape Town. Um, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you guys will uh, figure that out because um, the internationals really rely on on the Sakai community and they know that Longsight is a force to be reckoned with in the Sakai community in the United States. So anyway, those are uh, my <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> those, are, those are my thoughts on uh, funding internationally and design work and probably the whole the whole roadmap map discussion we'll get into. Yeah. Yeah. What one of the things I just added and Amy chatted in the chat uh, is uh, not overlooking the ability to create student pages. Um, so something along the lines of blogging capabilities where students are able to contribute content um, and that instructors can manage that fairly easily. Well, the one thing I hear from instructors at UVA, a lot of them use WordPress. They choose to use WordPress as much as possible over our Sakai instance because they like the ability to customize and make content look pretty. And it's, you know, according to them, that's easier for them in WordPress than it is in features in Sakai. And the other thing is um, the ability for students to contribute their content as well. So I think those are two pretty high, um, high level bars that we would probably want to shoot for with this new redesign of lessons. Yeah, part of the, the the goal is to make it a lot easier for people to make their pages look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, a lot of the things I that we're that. looking at doing are to enable that, to make it a friendlier authoring experience. And to, to Laura's point about are you going to be creating content or just organizing content, I think you absolutely are going to be authoring content because otherwise it wouldn't be a lessons replacement at some point or an upgrade to the current lessons because currently you author in lessons, not everything. You, you organize other 
components, but there is content that only lives in lessons. And so um, I think that lessons two would absolutely have to support that as well as any importing and exporting capability that would be needed. Yeah, agreed. All right, well, I don't want to take too much of the time because I know that Josh wants to talk about roadmap. So um, feel free to add to any of these feedback documents, um, put comments on them. Like I said, we're going to be revising them based on all the feedback that we've gathered at all the different um, uh, group meetings and, and so forth. And if you've heard this a few times, my apologies for repeating myself, um, but, uh, but we do really want to give everybody a chance to, to weigh in um, and, uh, and make sure that it's a real uh, community effort and one that's been kind of agreed upon by everyone. So, um, because it's a, it's a critical tool for a lot of folks. So we want to make sure that people are happy with the direction um, that it's moving in. Absolutely. So, these, these opportunities are so wonderful and important um, for us to, to hear the proposed ideas and to get feedback and, uh, you know, repetition is a good thing <laughs> in, <laughs> in this context, for sure. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to do all of these sessions for us. Well, thank you. We're happy to do it. And thank you for giving us the time on the agenda. Um, Josh, do you want to do screen share for the roadmap or do you want me to pull it up? How would you like to do that? I would actually love it if you wouldn't mind pulling it up. Um, Killing a few okay. minutes wrestling with screen share and big blue button is killing minutes that we could use. Yeah, better can, could you um, give me the link in the chat so I can just go to yeah, it directly? Absolutely. Um, so let's see. So I'll put this in the chat for everyone. So here's the, uh, the roadmap concept document, and we have a, a similar feedback document for roadmap as well. So I'll try and uh, there we go. Um, so I'll try and I'll try and be brief here. The the idea as Wilma scrolls to the the first page with actual stuff on it. So coming out of Open Aperio, it was there was so much energy around so many different things that we could do. There was energy around reducing technical debt, and that was critical. There was energy around improving various tools, and that was critical. Um, and it, it seemed to me that we needed to, at a minimum, sequence the order of things that we wanted to set out to do. But even, even more than that, we wanted to develop, we really needed to develop a shared agreement so that we weren't always reopening the questions of what to do next because there's, there's time taken on that that could be better used in other ways. And we also need to get institutional support for these kinds of things. So. Um, we would need a multi-year plan for Sakai in order to take advantage of multi-year funding cycles at institutions that would support Sakai's development. So a roadmap helps with all of this. A roadmap also helps with uh, conveying to institutions, especially those that may not be terribly active in the community. They are Sakai adopters, but not community activists. Uh, and they, they wonder where Sakai is going. What is, you know, what is next for Sakai? Should we continue to invest in this platform? You know, they're thinking at their institutions uh, when we don't really know what the direction is. So a roadmap helps to convey that. It helps to convey the key marketing messages also that we're focused on, uh, you know, that Sakai is energetically moving forward, that Sakai is for leaders, that, uh, that Sakai makes, it makes a great impact. So having a roadmap, being able to articulate where we're going in the next few years helps with all of this. So as you can see from the screen share in this diagram, uh, we're envisioning the roadmap in four different streams. So the, the first stream is UI, uh, and that's we, we would envision over, these, over this three-year period, moving from addressing low-hanging fruit in UI to potentially making major changes in, in UI. So all this it would be part of and connected with the Switch project, but I just want to make sure that that work is, uh, is represented here. Uh, one of the things that I have taken away 
from uh, you know from some of our conversations and some of the the competitive analysis that LongSite has done with Canvas is that Canvas isn't better. Canvas just looks better. So prioritizing the work on the UI is really critical. So that's stream number one. Stream number two is is a focus on tools and capabilities. So we'd envision uh, revamping a single major tool each year and making fairly significant improvements to other tools also each year. So that's the, that's the second stream is, is, uh, is a focus on tools and on, uh, on front-facing functionality. The second, the third stream is one that focuses on technical debt. So this is really a three-year plan to address a lot of the technical debt that we have identified over the last six months. So things like uh, removing RSF and JSF in favor of new frameworks, uh, doing upgrades to Sakai's core technologies like Spring and Wicket and Hibernate and Velocity. Uh, Earl also reminded me early in this process that we do a lot of direct database queries via SQL, and we ought to be using Hibernate to do that instead. So we need to remove those those direct queries, and that's that's part of this three-year plan for addressing our core technologies and our our technical debt. And the fourth stream is one that focuses on testing. So we need to move uh, from a situation in which a really great QA team tests everything via human effort to one in which there's automated testing that carries a lot of the load. Not all of it. Humans would need to test some things. But if we have automated testing for usability and accessibility, it's going to put us in a much better place. So this work includes building and deploying an automated testing suite and then writing all of the automated testing scripts for all of the tools and services in Sakai. So that's that's a fair bit of work. That's a three-year project. One of the things that we'd love to do with lessons, actually, is to uh, walk the walk and try and get automated testing written for the lessons tool you know with its deployment so you know even you know that adds to the ambition of lessons two but it's we want to use lessons two as a way to move sakai forward in, in meaningful ways and to be constant with this roadmap so one of the things that you'll also notice from this diagram is that the first two years well so a this is a very ambitious plan throughout uh it's my impression that uh, we we need to be this ambitious because a lot of institutions are wondering what's next. Uh, they are doing due diligence about Sakai as they ought to do. Uh, uh, we have learned recently that uh, Wake Forest University is doing an LMS RFP uh, in the coming months. So and that's uh, they they need to and ought to be doing this research. And so therefore we need to and ought to be ambitious, especially in the early years of this plan. And this is, this is like a three-year plan in an academic setting in that year one, we know pretty well. That's fairly well laid out. Uh, year two, we know decently well. We've got some pretty solid guidelines, but we might adjust a little bit. And year three, we've got some, some general approaches, and we'll uh, adjust and fine-tune year three as we uh, exit year one and enter year two. That's the way I've worked with, uh, with technology planning. At, at academic institutions in the past, and I think it works really well for this. It allows us to be opportunistic in year three. So, um, well, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down to the end of the concept document, so we're gonna we're gonna skip by the details of the year by year evolution. But certainly, we can we can dive into these, and you guys can take a look at these if you'd like to. I just want to note that this is a plan that requires basically two people full time a year, about four thousand hours, and we would be really well served to add a part-time uh, project manager for, I'm thinking, you know, 500 hours. So that's um, that's a that's a fair bit. You know, that's that's a fair bit required annually. The cost is non-trivial, um, and this again is is following the the hourly cost model that Longsight has. But certainly coming together to fund a dedicated resource to do this would be a cheaper way to do it, and we can that certainly is, is acceptable. I mean, again, uh, you know, it's in Longsight's best interest and everyone's best interest to, to make ambitious, energetic forward progress. So whatever the best way is to do that, this needs to be a platform that uh, you know has has lo has long legs to it, and this roadmap is is a way to make that happen. So, with with that said, let me uh, let, let me switch to feedback here, and if Wilma, you could switch to the feedback document, that would be great. So. I want to ask the same kinds of questions here, and I, I will, uh, once I raise these questions with you guys, we can turn to the stuff that's already in the chat and start there. So what aspects of this roadmap are on target? What aspects ought to be improved and how? 
and what's missing entirely. So, and, and again, uh, thinking, spending a little bit of time on what aspects are on target is gonna help us set priorities. If, for example, there's less funding than is needed to do all of this stuff, uh, knowing what's on target, knowing which, which aspects resonate most to you guys is gonna be a way to set priorities. So let's see, so turning to the content in the chat. So uh, Laura notes, when creating student navigation through a course, content such as quizzes, et cetera, are possibly not in scope. That, is that, uh, Laura, is that related to the, the lessons plan or related to the roadmap specifically? That was uh, concerning lessons. Okay, looks like this is follow on feedback for lessons. So, so yeah, so let me, uh, let's, when, uh, when the session wraps up, I'll make sure that that gets into the lessons document, the lessons feedback document, or if you're willing, you can shove it in there yourself. So, so shove it roadmap in there feedback. Right yes, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, we're a, you, you know you're a force to be reckoned with when people start shoving stuff in your document themselves. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. All right. Um, so, so turning it over to you guys, uh, what aspects of this roadmap are on target and what aspects could be improved? I don't know if it's possible to show that um, roadmap side by side with the feedback um, to remind folks. So Terry writes that uh, the, the breaking down of uh, this work into various pieces is useful. Um, and, and I think that yeah. this is still at a very high concept level. Obviously, if we decide that this is the direction that we want to take, then all of these projects will need better definition. But we, we're we trying to, to bridge the gap, uh, you know, ride the line between uh, presenting a high concept plan that wasn't too much in the weeds and uh, trying to be detailed enough so that people could have a sense of this. Those of you who are in the early conversations with me about this know that the original plan was very weedy. So, uh, so the intent here mm -hmm. is just like us. So, um, what else? What, what other things are on target? What other things could be improved? I really like the way this is organized in, in layers. Um, I think the UI work is extremely important and I would even see a placeholder for it in 2022. I don't I don't see that going away. I don't I don't see it all being solved in in 2 years uh necessarily. So might want to just have that be an ongoing item as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to make the point that I didn't think that the UI work could be a 3-year project that we really needed to buckle I down. See. Um yeah. but by the same token you know, we never stop improving UI. So, so for sure, you know, point taken. What else, gang? I personally like the um, the tool focus right now for lessons, forums, notifications is super important, um, especially for students. Obviously, they care about that a lot. Some have asked why lessons first and forums later. Uh, and the truth is that those could be swapped conceivably if, uh, if opinion ran strongly in that direction. Uh, it's worth noting that lessons is on RSF and forums is on JSF. So uh, JSF could, could hang on a little bit longer, but RSF is showing its, its fragility even as we look toward uh, version 19. There were things that broke uh, from the, the Hibernate improvements that went along with rubrics. So uh, I think that addressing RSF sooner rather than later would be a really smart thing for us. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I really want lessons to, to be the kind of penultimate tool. <laughs> so I I would love to see I think the focus is correct in my mind, but um, others may think differently. But I, I think lessons deserves the attention at, for the immediate future.
So Laura makes a point about forums and discussions, maybe third party tools, um, you know, maybe forums don't belong in an NGDLE. So this, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there are a lot of ways to look at, uh, you know, modernization of these tools. So it might be that we rebuild them in Sakai. It might be that we do a, a significant and seamless integration with something outside of Sakai. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to figure out how to do each of these projects. This is the roadmap is more about intentionality and sequencing and priority. Yeah. Uh, of course, I don't know enough about the aging technologies or the underlying um, issues that you've got on here, but I'm glad to see they're there. I'm sure the core team has contributed to that conversation in those priorities. Yeah, the, the core team had a lot more to say about uh, about rollout and about the the, uh, the the models of things. You know, so essentially, uh, you know, this was in particularly in the context of lessons, but I think it's true of a lot of other areas. Um, you know, do we do we build a tool alongside? Uh, do we replace an older tool with a newer one? I mean, the two models that I've seen in my time uh, in the Sakai community has been the the gradebook model, where you build a new tool and then you uh, you work to make it better, um, and the assignments model where you replace the old tool and have a migration process and really try to carry everything forward all at once. Uh, to Charles's point about forums, yeah, I mean, I think the the modernizing forums group uh, you know, needs to be heard on this topic, and I would I would defer to them. Some of us here are also in that group. I haven't been. Terry asks, would these employees be in long site or involve developers in EDF or some other? I think I think all possibilities are out there. So, you know, certainly, you know, if an institution wanted to wanted to step up and say we'll we'll manage this, that's great. Uh, you know, for on a project by project basis, you know, long site is certainly certainly willing to step up. Although we can't do we can't do all these things without support from you guys. And I know I that think uh, it's important to note. You know, this is not. Not a long site roadmap. This is a Sakai roadmap. So just because we've identified that we think it'll take, you know, X number of people, those people might not be long site people. They might be other you know, developers, other community members. So this is more about defining the the future of Sakai as a platform over the next three years, regardless of who does the work. But I, I will, Terry, note this uh, this thought. So part of this plan, and I think I think we won't know this until we get a better handle on on the funding. So I mean, again, I think you know I take this as define the needs, uh, advocate for funding, and when funding is allocated, you know, then at that point, you know, decisions can be made about the the organizational home of of the developers. But it's definitely worth thinking about. It seems to me that. This is one of the few drawbacks of an open source community is that in a commercial enterprise you can have a CEO say, okay, we're going to do this project and we're going to set up this new section or division to do this and you're going to be in charge of it and you've got these two people to do it, now go get it done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, Terry. I really do. Um, setting up a new division. I like that. Um, I think uh, uh, I've been reading some, you know, the corporate marketing trendy kind of novels, uh, good as the enemy of great and all the other stuff, you know, has like, you've got to have a an, uh, research and development division, and then you've got to have the lights, keep the lights on division. And we're talking about the, the R&D, the pushing forward, the innovation, the improvement. Um, in the open source community, the uh, yeah, that that could be a downside. I think I think the downside is more having to do with um, the time we require to um, to build consensus. But that's also an upside uh, because software development cycles always talk about bugs are are introduced usually. I mean, the sooner you find them, the better, then the less they cost you. And if you spend more time developing, building consensus, designing up front, then you will have uh, fewer errors that result in bugs down, 
down the way. So, yeah. yeah but that, is that better or is it different? Because, um, you know, it might take longer to get a big corporate response, but you once, once somebody makes a decision, it, it tends to get done. And whereas we're trying to build consensus and then say, well, we could pull this resource from that over there or ask this institution to, to raise money or um, hire their own developers to contribute back. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's just, this is, yeah. this is our have, paradigm. We have less funding. You know, we, we don't have a budget, a line item budget for it. And but our institutions part of that is, don't either, but maybe they should. Yeah, part of that, though, the less funding is because of the open source nature. I mean, there are some fairly, you know, well-off institutions, but they can't carry all of us poor folk. And, you know. Sorry, sorry. We appreciate that at Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I, would, yeah. I would actually take a different approach to that. I mean, I think that, you know, in some ways we've set the expectation about the, the frugality of Sakai and the, the way that Sakai uh, saves cost at our institutions, and that's great, but it means that there isn't funding allocated over and above, you know, what is needed to run, you know, a relatively inexpensive product because there aren't right. software licensing fees. So essentially, you know, to to make these kinds of big changes, uh, you know, people need to, to change people's understanding and change people's behavior in fundamental ways, you know, and, the, and I'm thinking the behavior of decision makers. So it, it's hard. Yeah. It's doable, but hard. So I'm wondering if we, would it be um, beneficial, and I think it would, to be talking to our, to organize some sort of um, meeting at Open Aperio to talk to, so that brings in our decision makers, the people who hold the purse strings at our institutions to share the roadmap and talk about what's needed in terms of funding and see, you know, uh, otherwise we're, I would like to see that as a more collective conversation than just one-on-ones with individuals at our own institutions. Um, and just want to throw that out there for reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I, that, I, I like that idea. That I, mean, I think that might have to be a uh, web conference. Yeah. yeah I'm not sure how many of those be. folks go to open a period. No, exactly. And it could totally be that. And it doesn't have to be tied to open a period, but, um, but yeah, I see Charles suggested also a conference call. I think that that would be great. And um, so maybe we could talk about organizing that in the coming couple of months or so. I, I love that idea. It seems to me it's a bit of both and because, uh, you know, there would need to be one on one conversations to essentially soften up the decision makers and, uh, and get their yeah. buy in to even join a call like this. Right. Uh, you know, but I think you know, knowing that they're not in it alone, you know, might help them come to the table in a different kind of way. Could we devote a little time in one of the upcoming marketing meetings, Josh, to talk about um, how we might, what voice we might want to use, what um, message we want might want to convey to give us all a little leg up on having, starting that conversation? Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, great. I mean, so I, I would say, you know, the, the, the track for roadmap is, uh, you know, it's similar for lessons. So gathering feedback now, kind of closing on that today, iterating before Sakai Camp, uh, deeper conversation, Sakai Camp, and hopefully adoption. And I think following, you know, following adoption, then I think that that, that would be the moment to start thinking about making the seller institutions and gathering the marketing team to help uh, facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not that we far have, off. Yeah, we have about five minutes. So any last comments or I see a few more chats. Josh says, I think part of the roadmap that you just gave would be useful in the decision, decision makers conference call. Absolutely. 
Good call, Josh, Sean. Um, yeah, so if we could lean on you, Josh, <laughs> to carry that part of the, the call with them when the time comes. Other thoughts before we wrap up? I just say thanks to everyone for the really great feedback. So that's uh, you guys really you know leaned into this, especially those of you who've been in these conversations multiple times. You've had new things to say each time. So I'm just uh, I'm I'm just grateful. So thank you. And we're very thankful to you and everybody at Longsight for all that you do to help um, move us forward. And this is huge in that regard. The roadmap the lessons um, 2.0 planning and um, feedback sessions it's, uh, are super helpful and we're, we really thank you for taking us all into account. All right, so let me Trisha? just... Um, yep. Trisha, did you want to give the floor to Sean? He says he has a couple of community reminders. Oh, I'm sorry, Sean, sure. Come on. I missed that. Thanks, Laura. Oh, okay. Sean's going to type and I'll repeat. Um, he wants to invite us to attend a call on Monday, December 10th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time to review and discuss priorities for the open critical JIRA issues for 19. Oh, that's great, Sean. Currently, there are 50 plus. And we probably don't want, don't have enough resources to resolve all of them. So if there are issues that you would like to, so we'd want to prioritize basically and, and use that session. For, I think that's wonderful. Thanks for that invitation. And then on the core call, a proposal was made to review the critical issues. And that time is Monday at 9 from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So that is in addition to the regular core call that occurs on Tuesdays, right, Sean? Okay, checking in on that. Okay, so next Monday, the 10th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, hope everybody can make it there to give feedback on that. That would be a huge boost to getting work done for 19. And today at 11 a.m., there is a UX working group meeting in room three in Big Blue Button. And on the agenda are methods for onboarding users to an application and recommendations from Duke on how we can make lightweight changes to lessons tool right now, I guess, in um, anticipation of lessons 2.0. But, um, that sounds great. I'm planning to be there. So in room three, in just a few minutes, in fact, in just one minute. Um, let me, yeah, thank you, Sean, for sharing those. Let me just quickly remind folks that our next meeting is on December 19th. We're going to have another Jira Palooza, so some of these 19 issues might be in there. Um, again, I'm going to ask for people to recommend JIRAs for us to review and um, provide input on. January 2nd is the meeting after that. Um, currently, we do not have a, it's open for a topic. And then on the 16th of January, we're going to have another Lessons 2.0 review and feedback session led by Wilma. Yeah, and that's um, going to be basically kind of summarizing all the feedback that we gathered from everybody. Oh, that's, that's perfect. Wonderful. So I hope to see you uh, next time on the 19th and uh, also um, join some of us in room three for the next meeting on UX. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>